Today we have with us Anna from BedZetic. Um, BedZetic is a legal aid organization that provides free legal services to Southern California seniors um, and workers. They also do, they also provide rapid response. In 2019, um, they assisted uh, 50,000 people with legal support. Um, so today, Anna will be talking about Advanced Healthcare Directive. Um, Anna from BedZetic has been very, very generous to help all of seniors to um, apply for Advanced Healthcare Directive. And we're gonna talk a little bit, uh, in a little bit like what that process is like. Um, for those of us that don't know what Advanced Healthcare Directive is, it's also known as a living will. It's a legally binding document in which a person specifies what actions should be taken for their health if they are no longer able to make decisions for them, themselves because of illness or incapacity. Every adult, especially every elder or senior, should have an advanced health care directive. Advanced health care directive is not related. To, it is not related to your financial assets or whom you want you know, to inherit, inherit your money, your property. It has to do with the type of healthcare you do or do not want to receive if you, if you are in a state that you're unable to make that decision for yourself. So one example is, it's very common, especially in our community, is we might be hospitalized and we may not be in a state to make the decision whether we wanna be on life support or not. For example, if I were hospitalized, I would not want to be put on life support, but my members in my family might want to say, no, well, we want to keep that person. We want to keep Bilal on life support, right? Um, so it's very important to have this document made. That way, in case you do go, you are hospitalized and you're, for example, in a coma, God forbid, and, you know, people, other people are fighting over the fact what type of health services you should receive. That might not be what you actually want done with yourself or with your health. So that's why it's very important to have an advanced healthcare directive in place. And again, this doesn't have anything to do with your finances, your, um, your you know, who you want, you know, to inherit your house or your money. This is about your health care um, and you having the right to how you want um, health care facilitated towards you in case you're in your state, you're not able um, to make those decisions for yourself in the future. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Anna and she is going to introduce herself more and elaborate more on um, advanced health care directive. Um, so Anna's with us today for a short time. She has a very busy schedule. So afterwards, what I'll be doing is I'll be collecting the names and addresses of those interested in making their advanced health care directive with BedZetic. Um, Anna will be mailing out the application packets and she'll be back on December 2nd. Her and I will be back on December 2nd with Olive and we'll go over on Zoom how to fill out the application packet. All of this is free and there's no charge to this. So Anna, I'm going to go ahead and transfer it over to you now. All right. Well, hello, everybody. And thank you so much for having me today. Like Bilal said, I'm Anna Dar. I work at BetSetic as an elder law attorney. We work on a big range of issues, but um, uh, as Bilal knows, this is my favorite thing to talk about because it's so important, right? Um, advanced healthcare directives. I talk about these with all my clients, whatever issue they're coming to see me about. I like to always talk about whether they actually have this document completed because it is so important. And I know that some of you probably already have one or may have one. Um, does anybody know for sure whether they do? No, I know I don't. No, all right. Well, that's that's okay. I, I will freely admit, I didn't even know what it was before I started working at Bethetic and started learning about it. Um, but I completed one right after I found out why I needed it. And uh, now, you know, I bother everybody around me to get theirs done because uh, it's, it's just so important. So Bilal did a great job at explaining sort of what the document is. I'll just do a quick intro of sort of what it is to start. And as, as Bilal said, an advanced healthcare directive can also be called a durable power of attorney for healthcare, or just advanced directive, uh, living will. But like he said, it's a legal document where you write down your decisions about your future healthcare treatment in case you're not able to make your own decisions or communicate. There are two components to an advanced healthcare directive and you can do either both or just one of them. The first part is that you wanna choose and appoint an agent. Uh, that's a person who will make healthcare decisions for you if you're no longer able to. 
Um, and then the second part is to write down your specific healthcare wishes or instructions, including sort of end of life instructions. Um, in this document, you're called the principal and the person you appoint to speak for you, uh, they'd be your agent. Um, and on our form, we have Betsetic, we made our own form that's pretty simple and straightforward. It's based on the California statutory form, which is good because <coughs> doctors uh, recognize it, courts know it, so it's very straightforward and simple. And we try to make it a very clear and simple form so that it's kind of easy to complete so that you will actually do it, right? Um, but on our form, you can appoint up to three agents. Um, you would have one primary, and then you could also put two people as backup that would only step in if the first person was not able to act. And an important point to remind you of here is that this is a big fear of a lot of people, right? If you appoint an agent, they can never override your wishes. You're, by uh, completing this document, you're not giving away your own decision-making power. And you can also revoke or change uh, the document at any time. So as Bilal said, and uh, and as I said, everybody should have an advanced health care. It doesn't matter how old you are or what kind of health you're in. Um, and the best time to complete it is always to do it now before someone gets sick or before things kind of enter crisis mode, because then it's much more complicated. It's a really common misconception that only folks who are older or who are expecting to have some sort of medical treatment should have this document done. But that's just, that's wrong. It's a planning tool that everyone should just have in place. And another really common misconception and an important one is a lot of people think that if you have a spouse or a child that they could automatically step in and make decisions on your behalf even without this document but they don't have such a right in California. We don't have that surrogacy law in California. Nobody has the authority to speak on your behalf in healthcare matters unless you appoint them to that position legally. Granted, a doctor may ask uh, and may uh, you know, find a family member to help out, but there's no guarantee. And there's no guarantee that they would have the person you would want to speak for them. So without a healthcare directive, family members can be left really confused about what to do. Uh, they may end up arguing about who should make a decision. Say you have two kids and a husband. Who, you know, then maybe all three could end up arguing about what should be done and who should be in charge. Um, and sort of the worst case scenario there is that family members would have to go to court and seek a conservatorship, which is sort of the legal authority to make decisions. Uh, it's a complicated, long, expensive process that really should be avoided at all costs. Um, and in some cases, you know, a physician could be forced to appoint the person they believe is best suited to act, or a hospital committee would make the choice. So nobody would be asking you who you would want to speak for you. It's sort of all out of your control at that point. So having a directive is, it's just a very simple and sure way to control your future healthcare treatment, to make sure that your wishes are respected. And also, a really important part of it is to make it easier for children and loved ones to make the right choices on your behalf um, and avoid any sort of family infighting and confusion. And this, when we're all home extra much, this is a great time to think about this, uh, think about these choices and kind of take a step to plan ahead by deciding what sort of treatment you would want or would not want in case you became ill and then document the wishes and share them with your loved ones. Um, Making these choices and having these conversations with loved ones and family members, it's not always easy, which I completely understand, but it's so important. And I promise it feels a lot better once it's done. Um, so how do you get an advanced healthcare directive? And regrettably, obviously now during COVID-19 and social distancing, it's a lot more complicated because this document does require um, two, per two witnesses that have to see you sign it in person or uh, a notary has to notarize the document. So that means you do have to meet with other people to complete the document, but it's still possible to do safely, right? Uh, if you just take some extra precautions and plan. Um, so it's still, it's still possible to complete it. Now, we used to always, of course, meet with people in person to do this, and we would help find witnesses and serve as witnesses and notarize, but now we can't. So um, again, there's a lot of different versions of this form available. I know a couple of folks asked, you know, if, if doctor's offices have it and hospitals have it, and they do. 
Some doctor's offices have their own form. Some hospitals have their own form. Um, and like I said, Beth said, like, we created our own form that we tried to make as simple and straightforward as possible. Uh, we also created a self-help packet, which is basically a very thorough instruction on how to fill out your own advanced healthcare directive. And that's what we're going to be sharing with you. Um, and then we're going to have another Zoom meeting, like Bilal said, on December 2nd, where uh, those of us, those of you who are interested can join, and then we'll go through the document together, step by step, to help you fill it out correctly. Big point to note, though, is that you would you will still be responsible for getting it witnessed or notarized on your own since to make it legally valid because we can't do that part, unfortunately. Um, but we will go over how to fill in everything else with you and we'll be available to answer questions over the phone if you have any follow up questions uh, and hopefully make the process pretty simple and not too overwhelming. So. If you're interested in getting a packet mailed to you and signing up for the Zoom meeting on uh, December 2nd, you will just, uh, Bilal will help organize that. He'll take names and addresses, and then we will send it out. Um, and you'll get the self-help packet and then a blank advanced healthcare directive form to complete. And we also include instructions on witnessing to kind of help you with that part as well. And if you have more specific questions on that, again, we're happy to talk on the phone. Anna, and I think we had a question. Someone asked, sorry to interrupt you. Does oh, it yeah. expire? No, it does not expire. These things are valid forever, but you can revoke it whenever you want. And you can make it expire, expire if you want to. If you want it to only val be valid for a year, that you would just write that as another instruction in the document. But as, as it is on its face, it doesn't expire. Uh, oh. Do we have to be prepared with some documents or info for December 2nd is another question. So that's, you will have to do some thinking. <laughs> um, um, this is a great, after today, you'll sign up for the December 2nd. You know, if you are thinking of, of, of joining and completing it, even if you're not completely sure, sign up and you will get all the packets mailed to you. And then you will have some time to spend some time with this paper um, and read over things and do a little homework on your own, you know, mull it over, think about what you want, think about who you would want to be your agent and maybe backup agent, um, you know, to speak for you and step into your shoes if you ever need to. Um, um and, yeah. Sorry, I'll, let, 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 me, let me go you finish and I'll ask, I'll ask you the questions that the people have. Oh, okay, great, 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 great. So basically, if you sign up this time, you will get all the documents to review at home first, and then you can join us on December 2nd when we go through step by step uh, and fill it out, and we can do specific questions then. Or if it's sort of a personal question that you don't want to ask in a group setting, happy to set up a time to chat on the phone and kind of talk over the choices. I have a question, Anna. Um, sure. So when you have this um, advanced care directive, do you have to carry it with you? So say if you're in the hospital... Or if 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 you are admitted into the hospital, how does um, the advanced care directive work? I mean, do you have to take this document with you all the time? Do you have to have it on you? Well, it, best practice is, and we talk about this a little more once you have it filled out. The best practice is you make a lot of copies right when you've completed it and it's valid, and then provide it to all your healthcare providers right away. Right? You can fax it to them or email it or whatever to keep it in your file so it's there. You also okay. would give copies to your agents so that they know, you know, that they're appointed and they know to bring in a copy should they ever need to act on your behalf. And we also provide a sort of wallet card that you can fill out, you know, just saying, I completed a healthcare directive on this date. This is my oh, agent. Okay. This is your contact info. Just in case, you know, if yeah. there's some sort of accident or whatever. And people, you know, look up in your wallet and then there's a card and they know who to call. But it's awesome. great practice to just give copies to your medical providers right away so that they have it in your file. Um, and then I think Nagar Appa asked who keeps this document. I think that pretty much answered the question, Nagar Appa, that you would give it to your doctor, your healthcare providers, your, um, once a document is made, and then you'd give it to the, whoever you assign as an agent. And Bedzedic, do you guys keep a copy too, or do you file it somewhere, or what do you do with your copy when we send we it? We do not. We don't ever have a copy because this okay. is a self-help setup. Normally, if I were meeting with you guys in person, I would have a file for each of you, and we would have a copy in our office. Okay. But since this is sort of a self-help process where you fill out your own and complete it, we don't have a copy, unfortunately. Okay. Um, 
And then I think we had um, Sister Sophia said, does this cover burial options? I.e., for example, if someone wants to be buried in a specific way, Muslims have a different way of burial than Christians. So could you put that in there? You certainly can. Uh, this does cover sort of post-death authority for your agent. Again, this is something that it's important to speak to your agent about because they would uh, sort of be in charge of setting that up, right? But we do have a space in the document for other instructions where a lot of people do choose to put down uh, religious instructions, including burial instructions. Um, these, of course, it's gonna be up to your agents to follow your instructions or you also have a space if you have pre-planned for a burial or any sort of uh, you know, disposition of body or anything like that, you can put the information in the document so that the agent knows like, you know, I have already, say you pre-purchased a plot or something like that, you can put it in the document so that the agent knows exactly, like this has already been planned and you just need to. So yes, the short answer is yes, you can, <laughs> but it depends then, on your situation. And then, um, so Sister Rahana, if someone didn't attend, I'll be, I'll be filling you guys in on what to do. If someone isn't part of this, we can get the packet to them. Fatima, um, I'll, yes, I'll get you the packet. Um, Sister Nagar is saying that Kaiser has people fill this out. Yeah. So Kaiser, Kaiser is actually has. really good at it. They're one of the best. I feel like that's most clients I meet who already have one. They say, oh, it's because I go to Kaiser because they actually follow through and ask people to complete it. Because a lot of hospitals and systems, they kind of, they may hand people a packet at some point and say, well, you should fill this out, but sort of with no follow-up. But I think Kaiser is actually uh, one of the ones that are the best at following up and, and, and keeping and, and making sure people complete the document. I think that happened in my case. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, cool, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is, Anna, did you have anything else more that you'd like to share? No, that is it. So just share your addresses with Bilal and we'll send you uh, information and uh, we will have more time next time and I'll, you know, we'll sort of go over all the documents together. And then um... we can... Yeah, okay, perfect. If someone from, oh, oh, I'm from Ohio. How does it work for me? I'm not available on December 2nd. Uh, so if you live in Ohio and go to the hospital and doctors in Ohio, then you should complete an Ohio Advanced Healthcare Directive because this is a state-specific form. Um, this is a California Advanced Healthcare Directive. They are respected in other states if you live here, but if you're living in a different state, you should use the, the form that, you know, that is following Ohio statute, not California statute. Is there not a na nationwide one? No. Every, no. every state kind of has different laws. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because it's based on the probate code. I know, oddly, but that's how it works. Yeah. Does it go? Does it work by the state you you live in? Yeah, oh. and I mean, if you have one here and you completed it and you go traveling, but you have one you know, the doctors in other states will respect that. But if you live, if you move to a new state, it's better practice to complete a new one that complies with that state's laws. Just in case there was an issue down the line or if someone wants to challenge it, you know what I mean? It's just good practice to, to complete it in the state that you actually live in. Um, Grandma Hakika is asking, does your agent need to be present at the time of hospitalization? No. No. I mean, see, and again, that's something it's again, a very personal choice. Your agent, you can choose someone who doesn't live in the state if that's who you trust the most and who you would actually want a doctor to contact should you need, you know, they can, doctors can speak to an agent over the phone. So it's definitely possible. I mean, at, it certainly depends on the situation, right? If somebody needs to come to the hospital, um, they, you know, they might be asked to, but uh, doctors can still speak to, to uh, agents over the phone. I've had oh. people who selected agents who had, you know, I had a, a woman who only had one child and he lived in a different country and she appointed him because that was who she had and that's who she would want a doctor to call. And that's, it's acceptable. So we can get one for our spouse too, I'm reading. Yes. Yes. I'll be, I'll be helping you with that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much, Anna. So everybody, I just want to keep some time right now because I'm going to have to go through on the Zoom and get everyone's names and addresses, whoever's interested. Did anyone have any questions, any further questions for Anna? Yes, I do have. Sure. Uh, suppose somebody already have living trust and they are covered with that. Do we still need to fill out this paperwork? 
if you've drafted a trust with a uh, you know an attorney you have you should look at your whole packet normally when you draft estate planning with an attorney including a trust they probably had you fill out an advanced health care directive too when you do a trust they usually make they usually complete a trust a power of attorney an advanced health care directive and a will all together so it's probably in that packet if it's not then it's not but it's it's not a document that would be it's not something that's covered in a trust but usually a trust attorney would complete this document. As well. okay. I, don't think I, I, I have a question. Um, I know when a person, when you have a family member is in the hospital um, and something serious, it's difficult for children of the family. Um, do you, at, on, as a personal recommendation, do you feel it's better that your agent is a family member or somebody outside the family? It's a really personal choice. And we actually, we just talked about this yesterday um, in the other group, because sometimes, right? Sometimes it's really hard for a family member to take on this role because of the emotions involved, but it depends on the family member, right? It depends on who you're thinking of appointing. Sometimes it's good to have a family member if they can handle it. And if they're you know able to advocate and speak on your behalf and sort of make rational decisions. But sometimes, you know, it's good to talk to the person that you're thinking of appointing as an agent and ask them, like, are you, are, you know, are you up for this? Can I appoint you as my agent? They can still say no. So, it, you know, it, it's not like you're forcing them to act on their, on your behalf. If they're not ready to act, they can say no. And then the doctor will just go to the next person, the, the backup agent. So it's just. Oh, oh so that's what I was going to ask if there can be a backup. Yes. You yeah, can have two backups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a comment. Yeah, does the durable power of attorney does not work after you die? That ends That's there. But this uh, uh, advanced health director will work, so your agent can work for as in at that time and decide to have a burial, Islamic burial, or whatever you want. But uh, yeah, so it's you really important to have this filled out. It is, it is. And you can certainly limit or extend the post-death authority in this document. But yeah, like you said, a durable power of attorney for finances, that ends when the person dies. But this document, you do provide some post-death authority to the agent, if you want to. You don't have to, you can take it out as well. But tech normally, yes, your agent still has authority after passing to, to set up burials and things like that. So, um, so welcome everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, Anna and Rachel are here from Beth Zedek and, and we'll be doing the, the application portion of the, going over the application for advanced healthcare directive today with y'all. Um, for those of you, again, um, some people are trickling, trickling in later. For those of you that, I think most people got their application packet in the mail already. Um, if you haven't, uh, Zainab emailed um, two PDF documents. So you can use those as guides and use them as scratch paper or take notes on them. Um, and then once you get your actual application, you can use you can fill that out. Uh, if for some reason you didn't get the application, you can use these guides and send them in or just let me know or let Zainab know and we'll send you a new application out. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Anna now who's gonna go, um, she's gonna take over. All right, well, thank you, Bilal, and thanks you all for being here today and for letting us come. Um, as you know, this is sort of a different process than it used to be since we normally would meet with you in person and see you face to face and complete these documents, but you know, it's not possible right now. So we're gonna, we're gonna work on it together in this way instead. Um, you, so, like Bilal said, you should all have hopefully received uh, the documents via mail and also via email. Um, if you didn't, don't despair. It'll still be helpful. And like Bilal said, you can take notes and fill them out later, and we'll be available for questions as well. Um, and there, we have a phone number listed. We'll go over it all, how you can contact us for additional help. Um, so you should have three documents uh, that you received in the mail, right? You should have one big instruction packet and then two blank copies of the advanced healthcare directive itself. 
we gave you two so you have one to if, if you make a mistake or if you just want to kind of scribble on one today as we're going through it and then fill it out very care you know fill out the second copy later more carefully um so the goal today is that we're going to actually review the advanced healthcare directive step by step and we'll either have you filling it out along with me or just watching and becoming familiar with the document and making sure you're ready and comfortable um, to fill it out on your own later. Um, and again, you'll have contact information for any personal kind of questions that you don't wanna ask in the group today. And we'll take questions as we go, if it, if it flows well, otherwise you can save them till the end and we'll make sure to have time. You can either just ask questions or you can type them in the chat and we'll monitor and make sure to get everything answered. So the plan for today is I'm gonna start sharing my screen and then first we'll go through, I'll just kind of show you the documents that you have go over what pages are there and what everything is. And then we will uh, look at the actual directive and go through how to fill it out and what each part means. So let me share my screen. Just a second, here we go. All right, let me just shrink this away here see everything. All right, so can everybody now see um, my screen here, which is a copy of the uh, information packet? Yes. Hey. Yes, wonderful. Good, things are working. <laughs> so first, I wanted to kind of start, um, I'll just leaf through this and show you what it is, and then we'll talk about it, just to make sure that you know what all the pages are for and what, what's going on here. So this is just kind of information that we're going to talk about. What is the directive? Why do you need one? And then we have sort of step-by-step -step instructions in here that we're going to go over on how to fill out the form. And you see their numbers, step one, step two, step three, um, all the way to the end, and then what to do after, and then we have attached documents. These are the attached documents. We have instructions for you to use to give to your agent later. We have instructions for you with the principal. Again, we're gonna go over this, so don't worry. I just wanna make sure that you know what the documents are that are in your packet. And then here, this is a useful one if you're filling it out later on your own. This is a sample form and we put corresponding numbers, one, two. So eat all of the steps that are listed in the instructions, they're numbered here so that you know exactly where, where things go in case you're filling this out later. So it goes through the whole document. <clears throat> and then finally, we have a, uh, an information sheet that you can use if you want to ask someone to be your witness, to witness your signature, that just kind of explains what that means to help you kind of ask someone to assist you. So first, let's just go over a quick review since it was a while ago we met last, um, just why this is important and what is it. Um, again, very important document, which is why I'm so happy there's so many of you here joining us today to take this, you know, the first step is just, you know, sitting down to fill it out. Um, again, this is one of those things that it'll probably, it may never be used. You kind of hope that you won't need it, but having it done just in case is such a big benefit for everyone, just in case something would happen, you know, and you end up in a situation where you're not able to communicate with doctors, then you have someone there who can step into your shoes and speak for you. And really importantly, someone who can make informed decisions on your behalf because they know what you would want because you talk to them about it. Um, and this also makes it clear who that person should be, right? So nobody has to waste valuable time trying to figure out who to ask, uh, and, and nobody needs to argue about who should be making decisions for you. So we do have a part in here about how to complete this now during COVID. Um, and this is an important point, right? To make this document valid, you have to either get it witnessed by two people, and they can't be the same people you appoint as agent, and they can't be your healthcare provider or you have to get it notarized, meaning you have to see a notary in person, either at their office or at your home. So what we're gonna do today, right, is we're gonna fill out the document all the way to the end, or you do it after the presentation, that's okay too, but what you're doing on your own is you fill it out all the way to the end, but you're not gonna sign and date it. That has to be done in the presence of either the witnesses or the notary. And we put some tips in our document here on how to get the document safely witnessed, you know, how does the witnessing work? We have some, you know, sort of ideas on how to do this on your own. Um, and again, the last page of the packet is that short sheet that you can use when you want to ask someone to witness a document for you that outlines kind of what it means and uh, is meant to ease any worries that people have 
about being asked to, you know, put their name and contact information and signature on a legal document for you. So that's kind of the big background and the, the big picture. So now we can go through actually filling out the documents. So I'm going to switch now from the directions to the actual form. Um, let's see. Can everybody see the form now? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so as I said, in the directions, there are step-by-step -step instructions. They're numbered. This form's not numbered because this is the actual form, but that this is what we're going to go through, and I'll kind of talk about them in steps, um, and, and we'll go one by one here. So if you're filling this out later, just as long, as long as you have the directions and the form in front of you, you should be fine to fill this out. Um, so step one. Seems very straightforward, right? <laughs> it's your name. Uh, so you basically, you just fill in your full, your legal name here. You can choose to include a middle name or whatever if you want to. Fill in the name as it, you know, as you use it, as it's on your license uh, in your medical records. And then we also included here a also known as or a formerly known as line. So that would be any names that you've previously used. Um, like if you've had a different spelling in the past, or if uh, you have a maiden name that you think that there probably are some medical records under, just in case it would ever be needed. So I have a maiden name, so I will go ahead and put that, just so that uh, it's clear in case there's any medical records that ever need to be accessed uh, in that name. So that's pretty simple. Then the first choice you have to make in this form is this box here the optional box. And this is where you have to choose whether you want this document to be effective, whether you want your agent to have authority immediately or only if you were to become incapacitated. And this is a totally personal choice. The default of the form is that your agents do not have any authority to act on your behalf until you're no longer able to do so. If that's your wish, then you would just move on to the next step here. But if you have some need for immediate help managing your medical care, uh, then this would be a good option. And you can initial uh, right in that box. Like if you want, you know, your daughter's already kind of talking to doctors for you and you want her to be able to, you know, call and deal with prescriptions or insurance issues, maybe maybe it would be useful. It's, it's a very personal choice. So if you want it to be effective immediately, you would initial. If you do not, then you will not initial. And then we're going to move on to the second choice here, which is naming your agent or agents. And if you don't want to appoint an agent, or if, like we said last time, right, if you don't have anybody um, to appoint as an agent, then you would move on to the next section. And remember that having this form is still very useful and beneficial, even if you don't have an agent. But if you have someone to appoint, that's wonderful. Um, because, right, the agent that you choose here, they're the person who will now have legal authority to speak for you, you're the principal, um, in any healthcare matters, should you be unable to make your own healthcare decisions, or immediately if that was what you chose in the previous box. So the agent you choose, it has to be a person who you really trust, right? Someone who understands your values, understands your beliefs, um, and your agent has to be at least 18, years old and they can't be your physician or and they cannot be an employee of a healthcare facility where you receive care. So we can appoint up to three agents in this form and they never serve together. It's one after the other because having two try to make decisions together can lead to ser serious complications. So we don't ever set up the document in that way. So if you have more than one, but first let's pick the first agent. So my first agent will be Bob Smith, right? Uh, and here it's really important that you put in, you spell their name correctly, number one. So make sure you have the correct spelling. And secondly, if whatever contact information you have, it's great, it's important to put it in. Um, even if Bob moves later, that's okay. It doesn't matter. If so long as you have the correct address right now, right? So uh, I am simply making up an address here, but, uh, you put in the full address, because imagine, right, if you accidentally spelled Bob Smith's name wrong, if his name is actually spelled Smythe, but you thought it was Smith, if he then comes, shows up to the hospital, right, and his name doesn't match this document, but if he can show, oh, but look, 
this is my address, this is my phone number, that is me, that's who they meant, then, you know, it's more likely that Bob will actually be able to act on your behalf. That's why it's important to put in addresses and contact information, even if the hospital and the doctor, they're not going to be mailing them anything. They're not going to send them a letter saying, hello, we need you to come, you know, help and speak on this person's behalf. Um, it's more to, to help identify the person. So you put in all the contact information you have and you see we have phone and alternate phone because who knows who has a home phone, cell phone. Just put in whatever phone numbers you have, but at least one, obviously, right? Um, whatever. I'm, this is just a sample. And email is great if you have it. So... Like I said, you can appoint up to three. So you would have, this would be your primary agent, Bob here. And the secondary agent or the alternate agent would only step in if the primary agent's not available. Um, you don't have to select alternative agents, but it's really a good option if you have someone and if it's possible, just so that someone's always available to speak for you, even if Bob, the primary agent, is not available, say he's out of the country or he's ill or something like that. So Samantha Smith it would be the se is the sec my secondary agent here. And then I would have a, all her contact information as well. And you see the language here, right? The alternate agent only gets to act if the agent, Bob, is not reasonably available to make a healthcare decision for me. This is pretty broad. If Bob doesn't want to anymore, he can certainly put that in a in on a piece of paper and sign it, you know, saying I'm Bob Smith, I'm the primary agent, I don't want to act anymore. And then people, then nobody will need to call him. Samantha can just act on, on your behalf without Bob needing to be contacted. And same, you know, if, if a doctor or a hospital tries to reach Bob and they can't, then they would try to reach Samantha. So she's the backup. And then again, you have the choice to put a third person, the second alternate, and same story there, right? If they can't reach Bob, if Samantha doesn't want to act, then the third person could step in, but they would never step in unless Bob and Samantha are both unavailable. Um, and here, it's important to talk a little bit about who the agent is, right, and how to choose the person. And trust and reliability are really the most important things here, right? It's more important than location. So even if you, the, your first choice Say you have three kids, one lives in um, Virginia and two live here, but the Virginia kid is the one that you really feel would be better at this. It's someone you're comfortable talking to about, you know, personal medical choices and things like that. Some of you who think could be, you know, a good advocate for you and be able to deal with hospitals and doctors and things like that, then that's who you should put as your primary agent. Not, it, you don't need to choose someone only because they live close and they're more available because, you know, obviously people can be contacted on the phone. Um, and remember that your agent can never override your wishes. Even if this document is um, effective immediately, that doesn't mean they have the power to say, to talk over you. If you say no to, you know, say you're in the hospital, you, the doctor is offering some treatment, you say, no, I don't want it. Your agent can't then come in and say, well, I'm the agent. And I say yes, and then they do it anyway. No, you're still in charge and you're still in control. Um, and also another important point to remember is that you're not forcing anyone to act by appointing them as your agent. I know some people feel weird about, you know, putting people on here, like, oh, then I'm making them do something they don't want to do. You're not. Um, they can decline. They can say no if they're not ready or able to, or they're not feel up to carrying it out, they can say no. And again, there's a lot more information on that in the um, agent instruction form you have in the packet. But it's just a good point to know. I mean, you know, it doesn't make sense to, to choose someone as an agent who, who would have no interest in acting, but you're not forcing anybody to do anything. Um, again, uh, make sure that you have all the correct spelling and everything before you complete the form, just to make it easier for everybody. So nobody has to prove who they are later. Um, next, once you've selected your three, one, two or three agents or zero agents, uh, this is just, the next part of the form just kind of goes over the agent's authority, right? And basically this document gives your designated agent the authority to make all healthcare decisions on your behalf that you would otherwise make yourself should you become incapacitated. Um, if you don't want your agent to have certain authority to conduct any or all of these activities, you can limit it by, by crossing it out, right? Like we have 
<clears throat> if, if you don't want your agent to be able to authorize an autopsy, if that's not something that you want them to do, then you can strike it out and put your initials next to it. Uh, you can also limit their authority by um, writing it out in the other instructions box that we're going to talk about next. But here you can simply say if there's one thing that you really do not agree, you know, if you with, uh, then you can strike it out. Um, then we also list here, you know, the form also lists your agent's obligations. And this is an important part here. And this is why we're always telling people how extremely important it is to talk to your agent because, right, this is what your agent's obligated to do. They're obligated to make decisions for you in accordance with this power of attorney, other instructions you make in this form and your personal wishes to the extent your agent knows them. So if your agent doesn't know your wishes, then how do they do it, right? So <clears throat> it goes on to say, if my wishes on a subject are not known, my agent shall make healthcare decisions for me consistent with what my agent determines to be in my best interest. In determining my best interest, my agent shall consider my personal values to the extent known by my agent. So all that language, right? It's just saying your agent has to act on your behalf based on what you want as far as they know it. And as far as they can figure it out by how well they know you. But it really just says, talk to your agent, let them know what you would want. And we do, we'll go through it a little bit, um, but we do in our agent instructions that we include here, we do kind of include a list of topics that are important to discuss. Uh, so it's kind of a guide to start that chat with the person you're appointing as your agent, just kind of to start the discussion about the major points because they have to know what you would want them to do. Next, you have another optional choice here. <clears throat> and this sounds a lot more complicated than it is, but I will try to make it clear. This is the nomination of conservator. So to understand this choice, first we have to talk a little bit about what a conservatorship is, right? Uh, and that a conservatorship is a legal proceeding. It's a protective legal proceeding in which a court appoints a person or an organization to make decisions for an incapacitated adult. This would happen, you know, for someone, if it's found by a court that the person cannot provide for their own personal needs for physical health, for food, for clothing or shelter. Um, this is, it's not super common, right? It's pretty extreme. It's where a court basically says you cannot take care of yourself. Somebody else needs to be in charge and be in and this takes it a step farther, further than an agent because a conservator actually can make decisions against your wishes because the court is saying you're not capable of making your own and you're going to harm yourself if you continue, essentially, right? <clears throat> so this is not a common situation, but, and often when you have this form in place, it should hopefully uh, prevent the need for a conservatorship to ever happen because you're already asking someone to speak on your behalf. <clears throat> but this box here is basically saying you have a choice here that if a conservator of your person ever needs to be appointed by the court in the future, you can elect to say here that you would want your agent to be your conservator, should it ever be necessary, right? So if down the line that ever happened and there was a court proceeding and somebody was trying to determine who should be your conservator, if you sign here, it would be saying, I would want it to be my agent. <clears throat> And again, this does not by any means mean that you want a conservatorship to be put in place, that you consent to a conservatorship, nothing. It only says, if we're ever in that situation, I'm already incapacitated, I would want you to select my agent to be the person to speak on my behalf and make decisions for me. All right. <clears throat> so now we have the next part, the healthcare instructions. And this is <clears throat> the instructions you leave to your agent on top of what you're gonna to talk to them about as well. Or these instructions would be used by your healthcare provider if your agent is not available or reachable or if you don't have an agent. So like I said, you don't actually have to select an agent, you can just leave these. And in this box here, these are sort of the, these are statute based on the statutory form. So it's very kind of clear statutory choice. And this is only, this box here, is really only for very end of life instructions, right? This box would only apply when 
when someone is in an irreversible coma or a persistent vegetative state, or if there's terminal illness and the use of life-sustaining procedures, as we see here, would only serve to artificially delay the moment of death. Um, so this isn't for all treatment. This is end of life instructions. And basically the statutory choices here are the first box says, I would want pain relief only, essentially. And the second choice is, I authorize all treatments to prolong my life for as long as possible. And this is a completely personal choice. Most people probably have a feeling of what they would want, um, what they want to select in this box. Um, I'm happy to talk more, you know, one-on-one -on -one if anybody wants to kind of discuss what this means in, in a little more depth or, you know, what your thoughts are. But it's a personal choice. There's no right or wrong answer. And this is sort of a, you know, pain relief only or do everything. So it's a very sort of a broad choice, right? But we also have here an other instructions box where you can add a lot of more detailed instructions if you have them or other, you know, other things that you want to include in this document on top of just the very straightforward end of life instructions of pain relief only or do everything. Um, so for this other instructions, here again, probably you would already have a sense of what you would want to include here. A lot of clients of mine leave this blank because they figure, you know, they're going to talk to their agent and let them sort of act on their behalf because they'll know what to do. But some have a specific instruction they've thought about <clears throat> and that they want to include. Um, adding instructions here can you have help. examples. Yes, I will go through some for sure. Um, adding instructions here can help your agent carry out your wishes, which is good, but it's also very important to leave very clear instructions to not cause any confusion or make things, you know, hard to understand what you actually wanted. Um, and you also want to be careful here not to unintentionally restrict the agent's power to act in your best interest. Because, right, one of the biggest reasons for naming an agent is to have someone who can sort of react or respond flexibly as a medical situation changes and to deal with unforeseen situations. Um, you know, so some people kind of have a thought in mind, you know, I would want to, people sometimes want to put like day limits, like I would only want treatment for 10 days and then pain relief only. But that's, that's a kind of a limiting instruction, right? You don't really know what situation you may be in. And some other common instructions that are that are help can be helpful. Um, one common one is, you know, if you have, if there's a preference to, to end your days in your own home rather than a hospital, if possible, or leaving uh, information about burial arrangements. Or you can also leave more specific things like, uh, you know, if I were to end up in a nursing facility, uh, you know, you can add in things like uh, gender-specific care or any dietary restrictions, um, like non-pork or halal restrictions it would be useful to put in here um, so that it's clear. And, you know, you can also leave uh, religious instructions. We have sort of a broad one, you know, that we use sometimes that you can fill in and I can read it. I don't know if I can actually type it in here. I can show you. I think I can. Let's see. Well, uh, maybe not. Oh, maybe. Oh, here we go. So this is sort of a sample of a very broad uh, religious instruction, right? All decisions. Ah, sorry. All healthcare decisions and post-death decisions, including the handling and disposition of my body, shall be made pursuant to Islamic law and custom, if that's your religion, right? You can put in your religion here. Um, and, you know, you can put in uh, <clears throat> any other sort of uh, post-death or treatment instructions in this box. But again, this is very personal, right? So it all depends on, on what your wishes are. And I, again, I'd be happy if anybody has an idea of what they would want to put here. If you want to you know, set up a call, I can certainly talk with you about, you know, how to kind of write it so that it's clear and to make sure that your point gets across because you just want to be careful about being very clear when you leave instructions here. Um, you can certainly also have, I, I believe, 
uh, Bilal gave me a, a, an example of, you know, you could list your local Muslim mortuary service if that is something you wanted to include here. And these are, again, all just suggestions. Um, this is a very, like everything else in this farm, this is a personal choice. Um, and it's uh, it's up to, to each one of you what, what you think is important to add here. And that is it. That's all that you want to fill out for now. You can't sign this yet and you don't date it yet because you want to sign and date in front of either witnesses or a notary to watch you sign it so that they can then fill out their part. And we'll go ahead and go over. Let's pretend we're in the future and you're actually, you have witnesses watching you now and we'll just go over sort of how to fill out the witness part and the notary part, if whichever one you're going to do. You only do one, not both. Um, so say you are going to have two witnesses. You would wait till they can see you. However, you're gonna set that up. Uh, and then basically you sign and date and then your witnesses have to uh, sign and date as well. And they have to actually uh, print their name, sign their name, date. And again, it's important here, right? That you have the same date because they're supposed to see you uh, sign it. So that's why I don't fill out today's date. Uh, wait till you're actually set to go and then date it and sign it. And then they have the same date here, right? Uh, but they would have to put in their name, their signature, the date and their address. And word of caution, this address line is way too tiny, but that's just how the form is. So they have to write small. And then the second witness, same thing. And then one of the two has to sign this line here. And again, we include instructions uh, in the uh, witness page that we included in the packet, right? That explains, reminds you that one of the two witnesses has to sign twice because that does seem a little weird, but it basically is just saying that one of the one witness has to be has to declare that they're not related to you or expecting uh, in the way that they are going to uh, inherit your estate. Uh, so that's really it for the witness part. So first witness, second witness, and then one of them, and it doesn't matter which one, it doesn't have to be the first, it can be the second, just one of them has to date and sign again on that line. And note here, this declaration of ombudsman program representative, this doesn't apply, this is only for people who reside in a nursing facility currently. If, if you were to reside in a nursing facility, you would have to work with the ombudsman to complete this document to make it legally valid, otherwise it's not valid. And if you're using witnesses, you're done after this line. If you're not using witnesses, but you're using a notary, then you would simply take it, wait till you're in front of a notary, uh, sign it, date it, and then the notary fills out this part. And that's it. Now, some other important parts about this document is, uh, the first thing is copies. You have to make copies. Um, to, you should, I mean, you should make copies to give to your agent, to give to your doctor. And again, we have instructions about that in the agent and principal instructions. I can certainly show you. Sorry about the scrolling. I know that's like dizifying. So here's the principal instructions. The principal is you. It does have a little list here, you know, that you should keep, you should make sure to share the document uh, provide your agents, your primary care physician, and other healthcare providers with a copy. It's good. Then they have it on file and things are ready to go. And we also included for you on that paper uh, a little wallet card in case you want to fill that out and just keep it in your wallet. It just I says I. The screen went blank. The screen went blank? Yeah, my screen went blank. I can't see anything. Okay, I'm oh. signing in on my phone. <laughs> oh, that's so strange. I, I can still see. Okay. Okay. That is weird. Um, so if you're going to go to a notary, it's uh, possible often that the notary can certainly help make copies. And if you're using a notary, another good uh, practice, and we put that in the instructions as well, but call the notary first, uh, make sure they follow safety protocols. If they're going to come to your house, you know, make sure that they're ready to set up outside, do it at a distance, all those things. And if you go into a notary's office, it's nice, like even if you're going to like the UPS store, mailboxes store, um, see if you can make an appointment so that it can be fast and you can get in and out and you don't have to stay there for any extended period. Um, and you can also ask if you go into a notary's office if they can make you copies because they usually can. Um, if you have a cell phone, a good cell phone or a printer at home, you can certainly scan or take pictures of, of the directive and you can email copies to your doctor 
and to your family members. Uh, it's just good, really important that everybody who needs one has a copy, right? Because you don't wanna be the person who did all the work to complete this document and then put it in a drawer at home and nobody knows it exists because then it's never gonna help, right? Because nobody will know uh, that it's there. Um, and also just, again, I know I've already said it, but after you're done, if you do, if you are naming an agent here, just make sure you talk to them. You know, you can use the instruction sheets. There's also, you know, you can certainly look up a, a guide on the internet on like what to talk about. But really it's a personal, it's, it's not a pleasant conversation for most people. You know, it's not something we like to sit down and talk about, but it's really important um, so that they know, so your agent knows what kind of things are important to you and what they should do if they have to act on your behalf. Um, and I think that's, the end of the document, but I think we have some questions. Is that right? I'm gonna stop sharing. Excuse oh, me. I have a question have... I'll try to send. Oh, so your family member cannot be a witness. Well, your family member can be a witness, right? If you have, if you, if you can get a non-family member to be one of the witnesses, that's great, but it's really, that instruction is really for if you have two kids and they're both your witnesses and they sign it, then they kind of have an in, like there's a, technically speaking, right? There's a little bit of a weirdness there if they have to decide to uh, end treatment, but they stand to inherit a bunch of money from you. That's kind of why they don't want, you're not supposed to be a, a, a person who stands to inherit your whole estate. It can be someone you're related to at a distance, you know, if it's your uncle or whatever that's okay. But it's certainly useful to have non-family member witnesses, like someone at your, you know, this used to be easier, right? You could have a witness at, at a senior center, but neighbors are often useful. You know, if you know your neighbors a little bit, ask a couple of them, give them that information sheet and ask if they can, if they can help you just sign this document. And again, that, that sheet, uh, it does explain, right, that by being a witness, it doesn't mean that that person is signing up to have any part of your medical care. Like they, nothing. All they're saying is, I saw this person sign the document and they look like they are not, you know, being forced to do it. That's kind of it. So it's pretty straightforward. The witness is not gonna be involved in anything and they don't even need to read the document. They don't need to look at the choices you made, nothing. They just, their involvement is just watching you sign it and that's it. Well, okay, so they're just watching you sign the document, that's it. Yeah. That's all the witness does. They don't need to know what you wrote in there. You know, they don't need to know what your medical choices were in there. That has nothing to do with them. And same with the notary. They're just notarizing your signature. They're not looking through the document. Excuse me, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, actually concerning the agent. So the agent should uh, go by himself to the hospital, uh, for example, or he could be contacted through the phones to take his approval for a process or something like that. Yeah, the agent should have a copy, right, of the document. If they ever need to speak on your behalf, they should just have it ready. If they do need okay. to go to the hospital and help you or assist you or speak on your behalf or, you know, try to help you manage care or whatever it is, they, it's, they should have a copy with them. Even if the hospital technically has it on file, just bring it a copy always um, to show that makes the process so much easier. Yeah, but it, it should be a personal communication or it could be over the phone with the agent. Oh, for you to speak to your agent about your choices no, no, or no, for the to, hospital? To, to, I'm sorry. To, to the hospital, to the hospital. Gotcha. It could be either, you know, if, if okay. they need to just call the agent and get their input or speak to them, that's fine. So long as they have the document and they know who the agent is. That's great. If, so yeah. if you've already provided your doctor and your hospital with a copy of the form and it's in your file, then they would know who to call and they certainly can and they can make choices okay. over the phone. That's why I say location is not of number one importance. And actually, I didn't really get into it, but this is something we talk about a lot. You know, a lot of folks often feel or worry that they should pick, you know, their oldest child as their first agent just because that's kind of well, it's like they should be in that position or something like that. But think more about who do you think would actually be able to do this for you? Who would be comfortable speaking to doctors? Who would be able to make possibly a hard choice if it needed to be made and actually carry out your wishes, right? So sometimes 
your spouse or your oldest child, maybe they're not the best person to be your agent. And it's not a popularity thing. You're not saying, I don't love you or I don't trust you by not making that person your agent. Um, that's not at all it. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't make anybody feel that way. Um, it's just, you want someone who can actually speak on your behalf and who's capable of doing this. And maybe that's not, you know, children in the order of when they were born, you know, it could be, everybody has different qualities, you know? Yeah. All right. I have another question. Actually, it looks like that I missed something in your presentation concerning the wallet card. Uh -huh. yeah, it's not in the document here. What, what is it? Oh, the wallet card is in, you know, in the information packet. It's okay. uh, it, on the principal instruction sheet. You're the principal. So we left you some instructions to read through after you've completed the document. And on the back of that sheet is the wallet card. And you can cut it out if you want to and, you know, fill it out and keep it in your wallet once you've completed this document. Yeah, but there is no witness in the wallet card. There is no witness. No, 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 no. The wallet card is just, just information. Imagine, you know, it's kind of like the, the worst case scenario if there's a car accident or something and, you know, people always check the wallet, like who is this person? And then they see, oh, they have a healthcare agent. That's who we need to call to let them know, you know, this person is going to the hospital. What do we do? Da, 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 da. It's that's just good. sort of a, just in case that's not a valid, that document does nothing. They would still need to see the um, advanced healthcare directive, but your agent yeah, would yeah. have a copy, right? So when somebody calls, they <laughs> would could come show up to the hospital with their copy and say, yes, thank you. This is me. I'm here and I'm ready to, you know, step in. Sure. So that's what the wild card is for. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any other questions? There's okay. a, I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, like, when choosing agents for um, for this um, healthcare directive, um, mm -hmm. and do we have to have all three, or one is enough? One is enough. It's great to have a backup if you okay. have someone that you okay. feel is suitable, just in case, okay. right? But one is enough. If you have one person that you want, and there's nobody else that you would feel comfortable, you know, mm -hmm. putting on there, then one is fine. Okay, I have a, um, maybe um, some advice on how you, we can approach our children. Um, so my kids are younger. I have mm -hmm. younger children. I mean, uh, uh, how, how do we approach them so that they, because um, I think that um, I know my younger daughter, when she saw this document, it, she got worried. Like, why, uh, why, mom, why are you doing this? Right, you know? and this again, I feel like this is because a lot of people are under and you have to, then you can educate them, right? I okay. mean, this is, I, everybody should have, your kids should have this document too. It has nothing to do with age. This doesn't mean that you think that something terrible is going to happen yeah. or that you yeah. are ill. Uh, the best time to complete this document is when everything is good. You have time, you know, it's, it's just a planning document that every single person should have just in case you know okay. it doesn't mean anything and, and I think it's just about alleviating their fears and explaining no this is just something that everybody needs to have okay and I'm fine <laughs> yeah I'll just jump in really quick um in my family like my child is too young and my husband is not able to make those decisions in a um, in a the life or death situation. So it doesn't always have to be your children and it doesn't always have to be your spouse. And if they're really having a hard, if your children are having a hard time with it and you think that they just, it would be hard for them or they wouldn't be able to make those decisions, don't, don't be afraid to pick someone who can. Right. Very true. And, and how do you find that agent if they're not your children or not your family member? Well, I mean, it has to be someone you know, right? Maybe it's your your best friend. Maybe it's your aunt or, you know, it can be, it's anyone, really. Um, it's anyone that you, it's someone that you have a close relationship with and that you feel you can trust. Or maybe it's not something that, that's your best friend, but someone that you think could carry out your wishes. I had one client who, she made the choice of uh, pain relief only, right? She said, don't put me on any, you know, I don't want to be on a respirator. I want nothing but pain relief should it ever come to that. But her daughter 
would never carry that out. She was sure. She's like, I know my daughter wants to be my agent, but she would never do that. She would fight it and she would make me, she would make them keep me going for, you know, as long as possible. But I just want to be let go when the time comes, right? So she knew my daughter cannot be this person, even though she wants to. So she picked, uh, you know, an old friend who had used to work in a medical field and kind of had some knowledge and that she was close-ish with, but not, they weren't best friends. She was just like, this person I know can do what I need them to do. They can advocate for me and they can make sure that I actually get, my wishes are actually carried out. I see Sister Zakia has her hand raised. If you can unmute yourself before you speak up, Sister Zakia. Click on your screen and unmute yourself first, please. Okay, I see. Oh, there we okay. go. Hi, how are you doing, Anna? Uh, I appreciate you so much doing this for us uh, and Olive. Um, I have a question about the le the name, uh, formerly known as names. Mm -hmm. Do they have to be le names you use legally or, you know? No, or if there could be records or anything somewhere, it's useful to put it on there. You know, if you have a former name, it, it it's not going to mm -hmm. hurt to put it on there. It can only be helpful, right? But it, it would be one that was like used legally or in uh, like at school or whatever. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Or, okay. All right. But not like nicknames or anything like that. No, right? no, no, no. Just anything that there could be okay. some sort of record, you know, just in case, right? Okay. And I have one other question. Sure. Is uh, can, uh, this uh, for the healthcare directive? Is this, uh, can this also be used like as a, you know, like, is it the same as a durable, durable power of attorney? No. Well, it's similar in a way, right? That Those are kind of the two main planning documents where you can set up surrogate decision making. The, this is okay. the Advanced Healthcare Directive, which is also known as a uh, power of attorney for health, medical, medical power of attorney or power of attorney for healthcare. This is where you put someone okay. in place to make uh, medical choices for you. A durable power of attorney for finances, that's when you put someone in place to make to act on your behalf in financial matters. Okay, so you couldn't use that document to like say, do uh, put it right in health directives, healthcare directives. Uh, They're do, two I separate mean, things. Know, They're just yeah. two separate things. Yep, yep, Thank they you. do different yeah. things, you know, and because okay. this document, your agent has nothing to do with your finances. They're not gonna be responsible for your, for your healthcare costs, like nothing, like they're just speaking on your behalf yes. when it comes to medical choices. So okay, if you it. need, if you want to appoint someone, and that's also a useful planning document to have in place, the power of attorney for finances, you know, then that's a separate Okay. okay. And the will, that would be something totally different too, right? The will Your is something will. different. Mm -hmm. A will only, you know, a will, you write it now and it only becomes valid after you pass, right? So that doesn't interact with these two documents mm -hmm. at all. Okay, got it. But we should have all three. It would be good to have all it three. It certainly would be good. All three, right? <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, I, think I see you. a hand. Yeah, and there's a question. You're muted. Too. Yeah, you're muted. And there's a question on the chat, too, once you're done with that. Okay, you know what? Um, do you want to, I don't know your name. It's this Galaxy tab, but you need to unmute because I can't it's hear you. It's Auntie, please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. It's okay now? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. My question is that uh, the primary agent, suppose he's not available or he's no more, or he is he refuses to, you know, he doesn't have time and he doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's not in a position, he's not well. So who takes, and uh, forget about the other agent, does the doctor, can the physician take the decision? And she has a copy too, she or he? If there is no backup agent, right? If there's no secondary agent, then yeah, the 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 doctor, the physician would follow any instructions that you left in the form. And if there needs to be choices that are not covered by the form, then that's when it gets complicated. And that's actually the question in the box was, if you don't have this document, does the next of kin become the agent? And the answer mm -hmm. there is no. Mm -hmm. In in California, we don't have a, an, what's called an order of surrogates. In a lot of states, there's sort of a list, right? If somebody doesn't have a healthcare directive, the 
hospital can just go to the order, right? Oh, do they have a spouse? Then they we will ask them to make decisions. No, do they have a kid? Then we will ask them, da, 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 so on and so forth. We don't have that in California. Commonly, that is kind of the order a doctor would ask, but they don't have to. And if they don't feel like the spouse or the kid or whoever it is is suitable to make a decision, then they don't. They could then, the decision could then have to be made by, um, you know, a hospital committee. Uh, or, and kind of worse, if two family members, this is really the big problem that you want to avoid. Say you have two kids, you don't have an advanced health care directive, you go into the hospital, doctor's trying to figure out what to do, they're talking to your family, and both kids, they want to be the person in charge, and they don't agree. Then you're at a standstill then things can get very complicated and both kids would have to then try to file for conservatorship, convince a judge that they're better suited. It takes a long time. It's very expensive. It can really wreck a family, obviously. Um, so that's kind of the danger that you don't want to run into. That's why it's so good to have an agent appointed because then that's the person who will be asked. That's the person who will act. And there's not that fuzzy, who should it be? Let's, you know, fight it out. Um, but answering your question, if your agent's not available and there's no secondary agent, that's kind of the same thing would happen, right? The doctor would try to figure out if there's someone else they can ask or work with and if they're suitable. And if there's not, then yeah, they would follow the guidance guidance in the document. And should tricky medical choices need to be made, they would work with uh, the uh, hospital committee. Okay. And not, it's up to the doctors, you know, whatever they decide at that, you know, what is... Yeah. To be done at that moment. I have a question about um, organ donations. Uh huh. So, in your instructions, you can be more specific about what you don't want to donate your entire body, but specific organs are okay. Yep. And does that need to be in agreement with your driver's license? Um, uh, when you get your driver's license, you're supposed to put your option whether you yeah, want to. Yeah, and on the driver's license, I think it's just you are or you're not an organ donor, right? And yes, you'd be on the registry, but your agent would be in charge, right? They can make decisions about that after you pass. So if you have specific wishes, it would make perfect sense to write them in the other instructions and also talk to your agent about it. Like I would, you know, I want this, but I don't want that so that they are aware and they can then, you know, guide that process. And on your drive, on your driver's license, should it say that you are an organ donor or is that more general if you have that? That's list? more general, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody has authority to speak about it, they can, you know, coordinate it after. Uh, so yeah, your license, you will be basically, your license, it, it's only an all, it's a yes or no, right? Organ donor or not. Right. Right. But your agent can can carry out your specific wishes after you pass. I think there was a question in the chat. Do we have another one? Um, I know you sent us printouts, but I was wondering if you could send us the soft copy. Oh, you didn't get the envelope in the mail? I did. I did. But I don't want to handwrite this. I would rather print it out with everything filled out and then have people. I uh, see. Oh, sign. yeah. You should have been emailed a copy as well. The PDFs. Sister okay. Fatima, I emailed it to you. Check your email. It was sent yesterday. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah. So there's PDFs that are fillable. Mm -hmm, of course. Well, if anybody has, you know, any further follow-up questions, our phone number is on, let me find it because I don't know it. We have a, a number specifically for these kinds of questions. It's not a manned line, so you would just leave a message and then it'll probably be me calling you back, but it's mm -hmm. on the instruction sheet on the, on the first part, uh, but the number is 323-549-5886. I guess I could type it in the chat in case you do have, you know, specific kind of personal questions that you didn't get answered today. Let me type it in. Three, two, three. What did I say? Five, four, nine. Five, four, nine. Three, two, three. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Trying to read your documents. Five, eight, Five, eight, six. There it is. Mm -hmm. um, so you can certainly, you know, send an email 
I mean, uh, give us a call and then I'd be happy to, to kind of talk over any, any specific questions. But other than that, I think uh, we are at 12 o'clock. So unless there's any uh, quick final questions. Thank you, it was very helpful, very instructive. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. You're Thank welcome. You, Anna, it was the time. Of Thank course. You, Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Anna. It's really, Thank you. Um, uh, really a great conversation for us to uh, have as a group. And, you know, we feel more educated. Sometimes we fill these documents and don't even know what they mean. Um, so now we know uh, what goes into it. It's a lot of important decision making. And it's a great way to end the year. What a great way to end the year <laughs> as Oliver's. Like you have such an important legal document done, but it needs to be signed, right? It's not. Legit. Yes, it's not done today. You have to get it witnessed or notarized. But yes, it is a, it's a great accomplishment. It feels good when it's yeah. done and it's you're yeah, completed absolutely. and you're like, I did something important and now I don't have to think about it for a while. And had we had this class in person, we would all have been witnesses for each other. I would have loved to sign away. I know, <laughs> that's how we usually do it. Yeah. Hopefully in the future, that, right? <laughs> we should also add thanks to Bilal and Zainab for making this happen as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can, now we can die peacefully. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> After you sign all, all our wishes will be taken care of. After you sign it, not to All right. <laughs> I'm going to sign off. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful Bye, rest everyone. of your day. Bye. Bye. You, you too. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. All of Community Services is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Southern California that provides culturally appropriate services to seniors, their family, and the community. Through its physical and virtual interactive programs, Olive engages participants in a variety of ways that promotes health and well being. To learn more about Olive Community Services, to get involved, or to make a donation, please visit www.olivecs.org or email info at olivecs.org. Be a change maker and together, let's live, learn and thrive.